welcome to Uncommon Sense, where we do our best to make it common again. I'm your host, Adrian Alquist, and today I'm joined with a very prominent Catholic figure. I'm actually kind of nervous about it. Um, Chris Check, who is the president of Catholic Answers, which I'm sure most of our listeners have heard of. Uh, but, but yeah, here's Chris. How are you, Chris? I'm well, and there's no reason for you to be nervous, Adrian. <laughs> well, I've had a, uh, a couple of interactions with you because um, I'm on the back end when you guys do the Troubadours summits. And um, I wanted to tell you guys about it if you didn't know. Uh, if you go to chesterton.org slash Troubadours, you'll see a free online series. And you can, you can view these, these, uh, these summits, we call them, summits uh, between Chris, my dad, Dale Alquist, um, and other, other, uh, Catholic, um, what would you call it? Hey, superstars. That's what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe, Joe Pierce, William Fahey and, uh, Dan Kerr and superstars is a good word. And in, in the good sense of that word. Uh, but I was going to say, I think my first interaction with you, Adrian was probably shortly after you were born, maybe at a, at one of the Chesterton conferences back when your dad used to do them at the uh, university of St. Thomas there. Wow. Okay. Yep. I remember going to those. Um, that's cool. <laughs> cool. Um, well, I'm all grown up now and ready yes. to talk about um, historical events. So Chris is also um, an expert on number, uh, well, on, on historical um, hi on historical history. That's what we're <laughs> no, on, on church history. And, um, and today we're going to be talking about the Battle of Lepanto. And we're going to assume that not everyone knows about the Battle of Lepanto, which but this is also a good segue into the next Troubadour Summit, because you guys are going to be talking about the Battle of Lepanto and kind of assuming that people know it. So, so we're going to be guiding people to this podcast, then, and then on to the Troubadour Summit. Glory. So, yeah. So, um, so yeah, what do you, um, if you were talking to someone who doesn't know about the Battle of Lepanto, what would you say? Uh, well, I'd say it's the most important sea battle in the history of Christendom. What a claim, right? You know, uh, there are two critical sea battles in the history of the West. And the first one actually is before the Incarnation. Uh, and it took place in the 5th century BC, right, at Salamis, where the Athenians who had uh, built a fleet using the Laurium silver, uh, uh, defeated the Persians and repelled the invasion of tyranny from the east of the Persian Empire. And, uh, and all that was great and graceful in the west flowered in Attica. And then, uh, so, so Greek thought and then eventually Roman law and then blessed uh, uh, or sanctified by the incarnation. The, and, and it was a great galley battle, that is, rowed vessels uh, designed to ram and sink one another. We can all think of images from Ben-Hur, right, to think of an ancient galley. Um, the Battle of Lepanto took place uh, a couple of millennia later in the year 1571, also in the Mediterranean Sea, a little bit uh, further west. But it was a similar kind of conflict between the, the free West and the enslaved East. In fact, this is certainly how Chesterton uh, characterizes uh, the relationship between the two in his book, The War of the Gods and the Demons, right? Or excuse me, in his book, The Everlasting Man, the chapter, The War of the Gods and the Demons. The Battle of Lepanto took place in 1571, and it takes place within the broader context uh, of what historians call the War for Cyprus. And this is a contest between the two great powers of the age, the two great powers in the 16th century vying for control of the Mediterranean Sea are Venice and the port, or the, the port is like another way of saying the White House or something like that. So uh, the Ottoman Empire, the, the Islamic Ottoman Empire, uh, headquartered in Constantinople or what would by that point was being called Istanbul. Um, so uh, it, 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 the conflict comes to a head on October 7th, 1571, 
at the mouth of the what we now call the Bay of Corinth or the Gulf of Patras. So if you can imagine Greece, you've got mainland Greece, and then far to the east there, you've got the Isthmus, 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 mm -hmm. connecting uh, mainland Greece to Corinth. Uh, there's actually a canal that runs through there now. There wasn't at the time. Um, and then you've got that big bay, that big body of water separating mainland Greece from Corinth, Gulf of Patras, uh, Bay of Corinth. Uh, and at the very western edge, at the opening of that, uh, of that body of water, this is where that battle took place between the fleets or the armada, if you will, of the Holy League and the armada of the Ottoman Turks. So that's a I could, I mean, I can keep going, but <laughs> this is well, an interview. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Um, that's a good uh, uh, setting, uh, good, a good preface to, to this battle. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, the reason we, um, this is relevant to our podcast and what's Chestertonian about it is that Chesterton wrote a poem on the Battle of Lepanto called Lepanto. And what 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 Hilaire, Hilaire Belloc described as the greatest poem of its age. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I read it to prepare for this again. I read it again, and it it's really good. It's just a good poem. So you guys should pick up this poem along with commentary on it um, at our at our shop. Um, you can look. I'll put it, the link in in the description for YouTube. But you can go to our shop at chestron um, and and pick it up because it's really it's really awesome. Um, yeah, we're I good. know when we do the Troubadours, we're going to talk at length about the poem, and I'm happy to do it as much with you now as you like to. But I will say that um, in addition to being just a masterpiece of ballad poetry, uh, it is also a lesson in 16th century European history. And your father uh, just did magnificent work, and I know we had other people helping him on that book, but just did magnificent work in providing uh, the explanations of the of the multitude. Every line is dense with some reference to uh, some personality in 16th century history, or some moment, or uh, 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 some ideological conflict, or, or however it is. Uh, so it's it is it is a rich poem, mm -hmm. and uh, and your dad did a great job there in identifying all those references. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. The the commentaries Dale Alquist and Peter Floriani, if right, who runs in our Chesterton circles. Um, yeah, it's it's a pretty amazing. Um, pretty good for a computer science guy, right? Isn't that <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so we'll assume that people haven't read the poem for now, and then we can talk about the poem later on. Uh, but but yeah, can you give a little more historical context, context like um, the, the people in power at this time and eventually the hero of the story? Can you talk about him? Uh, of course. Okay, so as I said, the two powers that are vying for control of the Mediterranean Sea in the second half of the 16th century, in fact, for much of the 16th century, are the Ottoman Empire and Venice. And we tend to think of Venice today as a... Uh, a cool place to go visit, right? With canals in this little city uh, built on what was once a marsh. Um, but the truth is that in, in the 16th century, Venice was a vast power. It was a city state unto itself, extremely wealthy with an economy almost wholly rooted in seaborne commerce and the trade of luxurious goods such as glass, for example, which Venice is famous for from a century or so before. Uh, so these two powers on and off throughout the 16th century are vying for control of the Mediterranean. And the mechanism, or the, 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 the device, if you will, the platform with which they use to uh, fight is the 16th century war galley, which is a, which is a hybrid. It's a sailing vessel, and it's also a vessel that is rowed. And that, that's important as we come to talk about the battle. Um, somewhat different from a galley uh, of the uh, ancient times, because n now we're into the age of gunpowder, which affects galley warfare. And so they're less used for ramming and sinking, uh, though there certainly is a lot of close combat coming in this battle. The Ottoman Empire 
in contrast, at this time in the second part of the 16th century, has grown to uh, the zenith, if that's the correct word, of its power. And this under its greatest emperor, a man named Solomon the Magnificent. And truly, not only did his war galleys terrorize the Mediterranean Sea, but the Red Sea as well, even into the Black Sea, the Persian Gulf. And uh, he had uh, alliances in North Africa, all the way down into Arabia, up into Eastern Europe. He'd even made a shot at the gates of Vienna that he was unsuccessful at. Um, but near the end of his reign, he makes a go at the island of Malta. Now, Malta, if you can imagine, kind of below uh, Sicily there and a little bit to the east, if I'm not mistaken, um, really is kind of a dusty and fertile rock, uh, but it had a magnificent natural harbor. And the Sultan knew that if he had possession of the har harbor of Malta, that he could use it as a forward base to continue his attacks uh, and eventually to take Italy, which was his goal, and Rome. You know, okay. just a century before, 15, four, excuse me, 1453, it's a little more than a century before, the Ottoman Turks had successfully taken uh, Constantinople and turned the Hagia Sophia into a mosque. Alas, right. it's yeah. a mosque again today. Wow. Um, uh, but they had eyes on St. Peter's for the, for the very same reason. So a great deal is at stake here in this battle. And, uh, and even if there was not a hope of a land invasion of Italy, which there certainly was, the coastal towns, the Adriatic towns and the towns along the western coast of Italy um, were the sites of regular raids by the Ottoman galleys, by the Ottoman fleet, mm -hmm. where they would collect uh, young men and boys from, the, uh, from these uh, fishing villages and then turn them into either Janissaries or into galley slaves to row the galleys of the Ottoman fleet. So, right. so, so the, the West and the East, the Islamic West, excuse me, the uh, Christian West and the Islamic East are in a contest for control of the Mediterranean Sea. And this is, you know, this is what the, the, uh, the theater looks like at the time. And making matters more complicated, the princes of Europe, France and um, the, 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 the princes of Tuscany, for example, you know, we tend to think of Italy as a united country. It's not united until the middle of the 19th century in the Risorgimento, which is a very bad thing, by the way. We can talk about that another time. Okay. The, uh, uh, the, Spain, Sicily, Naples, the whole, uh, 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 the Papal States, Tuscany, France, Venice, uh, Milan, they can't get along. Right. They're not yeah. cooperating. And the fact that they're unable to get along and unite, meet, you know, a, a, a divided enemy, right, is weak in the face of a united one. And so this is part of the reason that the, uh, uh, that the Ottomans are so strong. Well, the bid to Malta fails, 1565. Uh, a few years later, Suleiman the Magnificent uh, dies on campaign in an, an attempt to take Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, and he's replaced by his son. Selim II, who was not the soldier that his father was. In fact, he was a man of many deviant appetites. His nickname was Selim the Sot, so he was something of a drunk. Okay. But nonetheless, um, he decides to make a play for Cyprus, some say because it was the site of his favorite vintage, right? And, uh, and so he makes a play for Cyprus, which at the time is controlled by the Venetians. So the attack on Cyprus by the Ottomans further focuses the attention of Venice, the Italian states, the Italian principalities, uh, and Spain and Sicily, Naples, that they've got to unite. Even so, they're quarreling. And the man that unites them is one of history's greatest popes, Pope Pius V. I was going to ask about that, yeah. Yes, so, who, okay. who's, who's the reason popes wear white today, our first Dominican pope. Oh, I, didn't, uh, I forgot that. I didn't know that. 
Yeah. yeah. And so he unites them. Anyway, I'm rambling here. No, that's okay. I, that was a lot of historical context. I did not expect that. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to ask. You brought a map. Imagine <laughs> yeah, yeah. the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about, about oh, sorry, did you say the Pope again? Pope Pius. Pope Pius V. Pio Quinto. His name was Michael Gislieri. And mm -hmm. like I say, he was an aged Dominican friar. And when he took the seat of Peter, he... Uh, he was faced with a church that was in a mess internally and externally. You know, um, he's promulgating the Council of Trent, but he's dealing with the, with the so-called Protestant Reformation, the rebellion of the oh, Protestants. Yeah. So he has dissent from without, but also from within. He's got a clergy that has grown very soft under the Renaissance popes. And so he enlists a chap named Charles Borromeo, who's also a saint now, Mm -hmm. And they, they reform the, uh, the seminaries. And then he also enlists uh, the orders, especially the Jesuits. Um, and so uh, it's uh, Francisco Borgia, who is now the head of the Jesuits at this time. And so he starts gathering these really first-rate priests to bring fire back to the Catholic Church and make the faithful understand the threat from the Protestants and the threat from uh, corruption within and the threat from Islam. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, so what I wanted to, uh, the last thing I wanted to, to talk about before we talk about the actual battle um, is the person who led the, the, the Christian side, the West, and it, his name is Don John of Austria, and, or Don Juan, right? Right. Well, he would have said Don Juan, but we're English. We can say Don yeah, John. Don John. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so how, what's his, what's his story and, and how did he come to lead the, the army? Or the yeah. So Don John of Austria, and let me recommend a book here for all, for everyone listening. Um, and especially any young men, any young teenager boys who are listening. Uh, it's called The Last Crusader or The Last Crusade, The Last Crusader. We'll look it up. That's um, Indiana Jones, right? His name is Louis Duol. Okay. Uh, last name is D-E space W-O-H-L, Louis Duol. And it, this is a novelized account of the life of Don John. And so, you, and, and by the way, it, uh, Duol just completely stole it from all the histories. So it's actually quite accurate. And then with his magnificent prose style, truly brings it to life. Anyway, I highly recommend this book. Yeah, I, um, I remember when I was, uh, I think, in eighth grade, I did a, a historical figure report, and I did on Don John of Austria because I really liked him. I think he, I think he was 24 when he led, uh, led the Navy, and um, that's how old I am, actually. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> he was the illegitimate son of the Emperor Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and uh, the half-brother to Philip, the King of Spain. And he had already demonstrated a considerable military prowess in the Morisco Wars in Spain. The Moriscos were uh, Moors or Muslims in Spain who had been given the opportunity to convert to Catholicism by Ferdinand and Isabella at the end of the previous century. But many of them made very insincere conversions and now were in full-scale rebellion against Philip, the King of Spain. So... Don John had already distinguished himself in these wars. And by the way, I should say, demonstrating the capacity for swift violence when the occasion called for it, but also mercy, right, when the occasion called for that. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he, he was just a natural leader. And by the way, we should say he was a very, very good looking man. And uh, he had a reputation throughout Europe much the way Adrian has a reputation throughout all of Minnesota as a great dancer. <laughs> I don't know about that, but okay. About the second well, you part. You kind of look like him and with the beard there and everything. <laughs> and, and he was a great swordsman and he spoke Latin and French and Spanish and Greek. And the story goes that he had a pet lion cub. And, wow. Uh, a marmoset I'm, a, I'm, a, and... I'm a better sword fighter than I am a dancer because I have <laughs> okay, right. stage combat. <laughs> yeah. well, he, well, we can also say, by the way, he was very popular with the ladies of court, but he had a great devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And Pius V had a hard time finding someone that everybody could rally under. But he knew that even though just about every commander in this fleet had vastly more seafaring and military experience than Don John of Austria. 
he knew that this kid was just a natural leader, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there he is reading the last gospel, the story goes, after saying mass uh, at the end of mass one day in his private chapel, and he comes across that line in the last gospel, a man was sent by God whose name was John. Mm -hmm. And it comes to him, right? At least yeah. this is how Duwall tells the story, so I love it. So, um, so he, 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 he picks Don John of Austria to lead the fleet, and Don John, he just exhibits this, this quality of confidence uh, and success, and his, the men love him. And yet, when he has to crack the whip, he does. There are occasions where there are sailors who get out of hand or soldiers who get out of hand. There, there are some men that have to be hanged, uh, some Spanish soldiers who uh, 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 get, get out of hand. And it's very clear. And there, there's one moment, Adrian, the night before the battle, where one of the commanders, the commander of the southernmost flank, was a Genovese commander named Gian Andrea Doria, and Doria was a, a talented naval commander. There's no question of that. But he also was a ship owner. So he knows that he's going to lose his fortune if the battle goes the wrong way. And he says, you know, your grace, the night before the battle, there's still, there's still time to avoid a pitched battle, you know, an all-out battle. Don John just looks at him. This guy's, what, twice his age or more. Every man in the stateroom there has more seafaring experience. Sebastian Veniero, who's a Venetian, was 70-some years old, so three times Don John's age. And he, they just, he looks around the room and he says, gentlemen, the time for counsel has passed. Mm -hmm. Now is the time for war. That was the quality of Don John. Wow. Wow. Okay, that's really cool. I, I, my, um, my fan in me uh, for, for John has uh, reignited. <laughs> um, but okay, so, so going into the battle, uh, not only Western civilization, um, it has a lot at stake for this battle, but there's also, but also Don John personally. Um, yes. Yeah. And so we, uh, the, the fleets arrive, right? Um, did you want to say anything more before? Yeah. So, the, so yeah. The, oh, sure. So just to set, set the scene there, the, um, the Holy League, uh, which is Spain, Venice, some of the Tuscan republics, Pisa for sure, uh, Knights of Malta, mm -hmm. um, uh, Naples, which would have belonged to the Kingdom of Sicily, which I think at the time belonged to Spain. Um, uh, they all unite in at the port at Messina. Where's okay. Messina? It's right where the toe of Sicily, excuse me, the toe, pardon me, of Italy meets Sicily. So they all meet there. Don John says, no women on the galleys, and of course, you know, what kind of women is he talking about? What sort of women are coming aboard galleys? We would say today, ladies of the evening, right? Gotcha. So yeah. none of that. Uh, we're all going to this battle with pure hearts. We're going to make a three-day fast because he knows it's a spiritual battle that they're entering as well, a supernatural battle. And this becomes obvious in the Chesterton poem, right? So they sail across the Adriatic, right, uh, up to Corfu and then down the west coast of Greece, and then the, the day of the battle, they are turning into uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 the Gulf of Patras. And the Turks who have been harboring in the Greek town of Nafpaktos, which is what the Venetians called Lepanto, uh, mm. Nafpaktos, they are maybe a third of the way in, and they're starting to come out of the straits. And they have the wind at their advantage. So yeah. they're under full sail. The Ottomans, the, the, Ottomans, the Ottomans have the wind to their advantage. I, they are. They're under full sail as they're bearing down on the Holy League. And the Holy League is rowing. Now, you can imagine the men who rowed the galleys of the Holy League. These were probably, you know, criminals, um, debtors, maybe some guy who killed his wife's lover. I don't know, something like that. But Don John had promised all of them freedom if they fought well. And so he issued every man, he, he cut them free of their chains, and he issued every man a weapon. And then he issued every man in his fleet a weapon more powerful than anything the Turks had in their inventory, and it was a rosary. So the men of the Holy League prepared themselves for battle by falling on their knees and praying the rosary. And then imagine as they're rowing into battle, you've got priests of the great orders, you know, Capuchins and Theatines and 
Jesuits, Dominicans, and they're marching up and down the, the decks of the galleys, holding crucifix aloft and exhorting the men to be brave and hearing final confessions. So they're rowing into the wind, right? And they're praying and they're telling their beads and the soldiers are standing there with their arquebusers and their swords and they're preparing themselves for battle. You know, their swords of Toledo steel, the finest steel in the world. And Our Lady in heaven, her immaculate heart of flame is listening. And at this moment when the fleet are maybe a mile apart, a half a mile apart, the wind shifts 180 degrees. And so now the Ottomans are forced to strike their sails and up from under their benches are whipped the Christian galley slaves who row the Ottoman galleys. And now they're pulling against the wind. And then the galleys of the Holy League, their sails are filled with the divine breath and they're being driven into battle. Now, we have to be very clear here. In galley warfare, fleets would not actually engage under sail. <clears throat> you would strike the sails before engaging because you want the maneuverability that rowing gives you, that control of the boat. Remember, we talked about how it's a hybrid uh, kind of sailing vessel, both a rowboat, a row ship, if you will, and a sailing ship, right? So immediately before the two sides are going to clash, the Christians will strike their sails. So they've got that maneuverability that the, that the oars provide them. So they clash. And, and, and imagine this, my friends, you know, what's a galley, uh, uh, a good sized galley, maybe 70, 80 feet, something like that. Um, there's probably about 300 of these on either side, divided into three squadrons, though the each, though the, Christians have put these larger galleuses at the front, huge Venetian um, commercial vessels. Right. I, this is the part I, I remember um, studying about. Uh, the galleuses, I believe that was the first time they were used in a battle. Uh, they were That's correct. They're actually commercial vessels that the Venetians had outfitted with cannons on the port and starboard side and on the bow and the stern. And they, they were so heavy and clumsy, they had to be towed into battle but they pack a very powerful firepower. So you've got the galleys in the front, then you've got these three squadrons, and then you've got the reserve squadron commanded by Don Alvaro de Bazan, the Marquis of Santa Cruz, the greatest naval captain in Spain ever. And, and there he is waiting in reserve. But it looks like from above a crescent, right? And a cross about to collide. And that's in fact what happens. And, and the ships pull up one against the other and there's boarding and uh, a, 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 a troops charging onto one ship and onto another vessel, and the arquebusers come out, and you know, an arquebus is like a very early handheld gun, and the crossbows and the swords, and you know, just imagine all the blood and you know, the limbs quivering on the deck and the sea running red, and this just intense hand to hand combat, a land battle at sea, right? Mm -hmm. uh, going on for hours and hours. And at one point, Don John, uh, he, he's commanding the center squadron, you know, maybe 70 ships or so, 70 vessels. And uh, uh, Yulik Ali, who commands the southernmost fleet or southernmost squadron for the Turks, he finds his way up into the gap and he's coming around from behind to en envelop uh, Don John. And there, right, we have the Marquis of Santa Cruz and he's waiting in the squadron and he's been reading the battle and he's such a master of seamanship and he knows that's when he has to spring into battle and rescuing Don John and then turning south and rescuing John Andrea Doria. And the, the whole day is just full of extraordinary naval maneuvers and the divine intervention and <laughs> wow. courageous hand-to-hand -hand fighting, something like, I don't know, 30 or 40,000 dead, mm -hmm. all but 12 of the Turkish galleys are captured or sunk mm -hmm. by the end of the day. At All some point, it, well, I was gonna say, uh, there might not, th this doesn't fit in, but Cervantes uh, fights in, in the battle, right? It very much does for it, fit in. Of course, he's, fight, he's a Spanish soldier at the time. Mm -hmm. And he's about, you know, your age too. He's a very, very young man. Mm -hmm. And Cervantes, part of his left hand 
is wounded by a Turkish musket ball, but of course he keeps all of his right to one day pen Spain's greatest novel, Don Quixote, where yeah. he so where he so joyfully um, makes fun of in just the most uh, affectionate way, you know, the life of uh, of chivalry, the life of the knight, which he himself had been such an active participant in, and that's why it's so wonderful. So, yeah, yeah, I know. I, it, that I mean, that story just is is just anecdotal and doesn't really fit into the whole narrative, but it's there, <laughs> right? It's like, uh, well, you know what? I think Chesterton brings it all in because, he does, yeah. you know, Adrian, there's a moment, I think the Cervantes story is very much at the heart of this, and I'll tell you why. Wow, there's a okay. Mo- there's a moment right before the galleys collide, uh, at the flagships. So you've got Don John's Real, and you've got Ulick, uh, no, uh, yeah, uh, no, Muzanzari Ali Pasha's uh, Sultana, and they're just about to collide, which is totally breaks the convention for naval warfare at the time that the flagships would, would even engage. And they're just about to collide. And there is Don John. And remember, we talked about what a great dancer he was. He's <laughs> on the prow of Real, and he's so consumed with battle joy that he breaks into a galliard, which is a very kind of, if you will, mm, sexy or erotic dance. I mean, it's a dance of courtship that was very popular in the 16th mm-hmm. century. And of course, his men know he's like the greatest dancer and they're like all cheering. But how do you explain this? This 24 year old, he's about to go to battle and he's breaking to a dance. It's battle joy. He's just consumed with the joy of the impending clash, right? And that's mm-hmm. the joy of the Christian, right? That's the joy of the Christian. And that's what Cervantes has. As that's well. what, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then Chesterton mentions Cervantes at the end of the poem. Of he poem. does. He does. Cervantes on his gal, he puts the sword back in the sheath. <laughs> nice. Nice. Do you have it memorized? Do I do. Book? And I'm, yeah, I'm oh, wow. actually kind of scandalized, Adrian, that any offspring of Dale Elquist does not have the poem memorized. <laughs> oh no. Are you going to be reciting it from memory uh, uh, when you do the troubadours? I am. Nice, nice. Okay, that's going to be good. It's it's going to be great. Yeah, that was an amazing description. So, how does the the battle end then? Well, that the the, the uh, as I say, the Turkish vessel vessels are either sunk or captured. Uh, the Christian uh, galley slaves are set free, um, and then uh, it must be stated that the um, the experts. Uh, on the Ottoman side are pretty much sum- summarily uh, executed. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the, yeah. the fact is that a galley is a very complex thing to put to sea. It's relatively easy to build one. It's very hard to operate one. So you need uh, these galley captains who are especially skilled at maneuvering this hybrid vessel, coordinating the oars, with the sail power, and it takes a lot of training. And so they kill them all because mm. it could be, uh, you know, uh, half a year or so the Sultan could put new ships into the Mediterranean. But if he didn't have the experts to operate them, um, then, it, then he never really would take control of the Mediterranean ever again. And he doesn't. I mean, there are subsequent battles yeah, that yeah. follow. So, right. Uh, Is it, didn't, it, didn't the war go on for quite a while after that? Well, um, you know, the, the, the conflict between uh, the Islamic East and the Christian West continues uh, really for another century. The important point here, of course, is Italy is saved from land invasion. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christendom is saved from a complete Islamic uh, takeover. But, you know, if you're a Greek, it's into the 19th century before you're actually free from Ottoman rule, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, and then, uh, but, but the, the next big moment where the eclipse of the Ottomans really g- picks up steam is 1683, the gates of Vienna, okay. uh, with okay. John Sobieski there. And that's another holy day on the calendar, by the way. So this day, October 7th, mm-hmm. Feast of the Holy Rosary, right? Which, yeah, we're going to be airing this that day. So it's, it's going to be today for... Listeners who- oh, okay. Right. Very good. Uh, yeah. And then uh, September 12th, which we just celebrated right last month, um, celebrates the victory of the winged hussars there at the gates of Vienna, turning back the Ottoman forces there who were v- very nearly uh, took, very nearly took Vienna. So, and then after that, 
yes, then you have the slow decline of what was truly a, a, a great empire. There's no question. Cool. Uh, the but last one, but one built on tyranny, not freedom. Right, right. Uh, the... Which I mean, this is really what, it, what Islam is. There's no freedom in Islam. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, is, it is a religion of tyranny. It's the religion of a capricious God. Mm. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Free will. Yeah, it's 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 the, it's 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 the caprice of Allah, mm -hmm. right? And um, carnal pleasure. Yeah, we obviously we have to have you on again to talk about all these other events and uh, Islam, maybe. But but uh, the last question I had about history was um, was the fact that didn't, didn't the Pope have a vision? Right. Okay. So the story goes that uh, Pope Pius the Fifth was meeting with his cardinals at the Dominican church, because he was a Dominican, Santa Sabina on the Aventine Hill, where the orange trees are that are alleged to be descendants of trees planted by Dom, St. Dominic himself. And you get that beautiful view back across the Tiber with St. Peter's in the distance, right? And, um, and he pauses there talking and he looks out the window and in the, in the sky, uh, Our Lady favors him with a vision of the victory of the battle. And he turns to his cardinals and he says let us set aside business and fall on our knees for our lord and our lady have given our fleet a great victory right wow so even even before the word actually made its way back to the italian peninsula the faithful who had packed the churches you know telling their beads yeah. were up and down the Penin uh, italian peninsula celebrating the great victory that's wow yeah that was an amazing uh uh D d uh, explanation of the battle it was so so uh captivating um yeah if anybody wants a longer than if anybody needs sleep help sleeping at night right here the three-hour version you can get <laughs> from shop.catholic.com so you explain it in that in What's that, that? You, you explain it in that three-hour uh everything we've talked about and more oh man cool cool yeah yeah i'll um yeah i i encourage you to to get that um so uh, we've almost exhausted our time. Um, I just wanted to mention the poem. First of all, what's your what's your favorite line in the poem? Other than oh, you can't pick, you can't pick dim drums throbbing in the hills. In from the hills have heard yeah. we're only on a nameless throne. A crownless prince is stirred. I actually really like the second line where the the nameless um, the nameless what is it, uh, a prince? Yeah. Where, yeah, we're risen from a doubtful seat in half a tainted stall. I think this is the line I like. The last night of Europe takes weapons from the wall. Mm. But there's also the scene where Maha there, there's also the scene where Muhammad or Mahound is talking to uh, all these demons that he's summoned mm. up, and he's describing the Christian soldier. And it's mm. the it, it, they're the most beautiful lines in poetry. And of course, they come from the mouth of the enemy. Mm -hmm. And yet they describe the Christian soldier. And this goes to our point about battle joy. What does he say? It is he that saith not kismet. It is he that knows not fate. It is Richard. It is Raymond. It is Godfrey at the gate. And then here's the line. It is he whose loss is laughter when he counts the wager worth. Right? The yeah. Christian soldier goes to it with total joy in his heart because he right. knows what's waiting for him. And that's, that's kind of like the, uh, the last line, which, which uh, is talking about Don John. He says, yeah, he smiles, but not as Sultan smile and yep. settles back the blade. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I like, I really like that line too. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, you, you guys are going to be talking about the poem, uh, during the Troubadour summit and I encourage you all to, to go and, and watch that live. It's the third Tuesday of every month. And so, right. yep. And so it's going to be, uh, really, really cool. I'm going to be on the back end operating and everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. What were we going to say? I can tell you that we, we will be broadcasting uh, my portion of that from the set of the Catholic Answers School of Apologetics. So everybody will get a chance to see our, uh, our School of Apologetics set that night. Cool. Cool. That's really awesome. Uh, well, it's, it's a beautiful set and we have a great video team here. Mm -hmm. Your that set is is beautiful, I would say. That, I, I was talking to Chris before that, before this, and it's it's nice. <laughs> but you can, um, you can do a lot with good lighting. I know, I know. Yep. Um well I that's I you've answered all my questions and, and more. Um yeah, that was a great explanation, a great historical lesson that you gave. I'll tell you, can I can I tell do I have time for one more thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, of course, this story is not especially well known to Americans because we get mostly the kind of history we get because we're a British, British Protestant nation, uh, at least in our, in our origins. 
um, we tend to get British Protestant history. So we don't know Mediterranean Catholic history. But here's a piece of American history related to the Battle of Lepanto. Uh, 40 years before, 50 years, excuse me, yeah, 40 years before the Battle of Lepanto, Our Lady appeared to a peasant and left an image of herself on his smock, right? Juan Diego mm -hmm. here in, uh, in Mexico uh, and uh, on Tepeyac Hill. And, uh, an R and, and the bishop, a man named Zumaraga, who was the first clergyman, first, the first person to behold the image, um, had a local artist paint five copies of the image and he gave one of them to Philip II, King of Spain, who gave it as a gift to John Andrea Doria, who carried it on his galley at Lepanto. So Our Lady of Guadalupe was at Lepanto. And if you want to see that image, that, that, that exact painting, it hangs in the Doria family chapel in a little mountain town uh, north of Genoa, like, I don't know, 70 kilometers or something up in the mountains um, called San Stefano. And you can still see that image today and it's very unusual because it's a painting it's clearly a copy and unlike the original it has a crown it has a crown on our lady's head but cool. our lady of guadalupe was at lepanto so there's some american catholic history yeah that's amazing yeah all right well that it, it, and that's do you have anything else um you want to say a, i have a lot more get the cd <laughs> yeah yeah okay <laughs> great uh, yeah, I mean, thank you, thank you so much for coming on, Chris, My and pleasure. and telling the story of the Battle of Lepanto. Well, I should say in conclusion, I, Adrian, I would not know this story if it weren't for your dad mm. and that sweet old librarian from Canada, whose name I can't remember, and I'm sure she's gone to her reward. Mm. And she gave a talk at one of those Ch early, early Chesterton conferences. It might have been the first one I ever spoke at, and she said. When I was in the fifth grade, I had to memorize Lepanto in detention, and I couldn't leave until I memorized it. And I thought to myself, no way. So I said, well, if that lady could do it when she was in the fifth grade, I can too. And that's how it all started. So it's because of your dad that I know this story. All right. I will memorize it. How about that? I'll memorize it. Yep. And, and good. I'll have to do that before I have you on again. Okay. Great. Good, good, good. <laughs> All right, cool. All right. God Thank bless you, so you brother. Thank you so much. And everyone, uh, uh, thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, until next time, help us to make uncommon sense more common.